and does not convey an idea of the extent of the problem. And it is in the quantitative aspect of the collapse of its higher education that Brazil goes beyond the imagination of those who complain of the poor state of university education in their own countries. Maybe you can have a better idea of Brazil's state of things in education when you know the fact that my native country, having more university professors per capita than any other nation, and now having virtually no children out of school, produces students who usually rank last in international education tests. Not coincidentally, Brazil is also a country in which all public discussion about education always revolves around funding and investments without the education, educational contents and techniques ever becoming a discussion point. Consequently, one must infer that to the Brazilian national imagination, money must have some educational power in itself, transcending human agency. The even more characteristic of the Brazilian mind of today is the fact that our former president, Mr. Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, has become an object of general admiration not because he has risen from a poor background thanks to a cultural improvement he achieved through his own efforts, but precisely because he managed to climb up the social ladder with no cultural improvement at, at all. People even compared him to Abraham Lincoln, but the contrast could not be greater between the poor axmen who developed intellectually to become one of the best writers of the English language and the man who distinguished himself rather by his physical, physical transfiguration of a bearded and tattered poor man into an elegant figure, figure with polished nails and dressed in sumptuous Armani suits than for any remarkable progress he made to overcome his original illiteracy. Brazil's history is led with poor people who acquired an education through their own efforts and rose by their own intellectual merits far above their original station in life. I would even say that they preponderate numerically over the notable men of the upper class. The public prestige of Mr. Luiz Inácio is, in this sense, a most significant sociological phenomenon because it indicates a radical change and the judging criterion employed to evaluate the social rise of the humble. Previously, the value of an education acquired by one's own merits prevailed over the hierarchy of social positions. But the success of Mr. Lula shows that this judgment has been reversed. Being in high places is valued in itself much more than any effort of self-education. I mention this phenomenon because, more than any other, it denotes the mental state of affairs in contemporary Brazil. The worship of high places, coupled with the most arrogant contempt for knowledge, has become the general rule. In Brazil, a person is no longer required to have made discoveries, created works, and generated great ideas to be acknowledged as an intellectual and an educator of the masses. Rather, what is required of him is that he has occupied civil service positions, held in offices, held, held offices in the public administration, been a member of government commissions. In short, what counts is not who he, who he is in terms of the substance of his creative and thinking person, but in terms of his place in the state bureaucracy. I began documenting this state of things in my 1995 book, The Collective Imbecile, Brazilian and Cultural News. But since then, the situation has worsened so formidably that it can no longer be described in a comic and satiric key as it was in that book. Public stupidity has grown to the point where it has become fearful. It has established itself as a form of power which can impose upon a whole generation of students the most complete ineptitude as an essential regulatory obligation. Because of this state of things, in 2005, 
I created an online philosophy seminar, which today has about 3,000 students from all over Brazil and also some other countries. Based on the final projects I have received so far, I am sure that these students, who I ask you to refrain from any public activity until they are properly prepared for it, are already an intellectual elite incomparably superior to that which has come out of Brazilian universities and occupy the most important positions in the media, education, and the publishing industry. Never have I thought about educate, educating other people than those who fell within my reach through the philosophy seminar. Nor do I have suggestions about the teaching of subjects which are outside my field of expertise. My students are being educated in the fields of literature, philosophy, and social sciences, precisely those which have been most affected after four decades of absolute rules of the semi-illiterate Mandarinate. However, from this limited experience, I can draw some conclusions which may be useful to other people who have the intention of becoming educators. The first is that the content for knowledge in Brazil has always been coupled with the worship of outward science which stand for knowledge and which seemingly with some advantage replace it. Degrees, diplomas, titles, honors, media space, good connections in high circles, and so on and so forth. The phenomenon has been so widely documented and satirized in our best fiction literature, Lima Barreto and Versilio Moranos, for example, that I see no need to insist on it. But the worst is that the circle of mutual reinforcement between those two complementary vices was formed a long time ago, and the circle seems impossible to break. It works like this. Since our business and political elite is not exactly well-educated, the well-meaning souls who emerge from it, having the laudable purpose of remedying the national evils, are by themselves unable to distinguish through a direct examination of words and ideas between who is competent and who is an eminent airhead among the available intellectuals. As a result, they will have to judge them by outward signs, those darn titles and positions, and they will end up giving it to those who have nothing important to tell them, nor useful to suggest. And culture generates and culture with the fertility of a couple of rabbits. This becomes even worse when a deceiving prestige comes from abroad landing in Brazil with all the pomp and ceremony suited to the most modern thing of all. In the Vargas administration, this was in the 40s, eh? a beautiful project of popular education ended up taking as model the ideas of John Dewey, then very celebrated by the American media as a great innovator. Today it is known that Dewey was in fact the destroyer of American education which until then was the best in the world. From 1960s onwards, during the military dictatorship in Brazil, social constructivism became fashionable, being adorned with names such as Jean Piaget, Emilia Ferreiro, Vygotsky, and many others. For half a century, the application of this nonsensical theory has brutalized the minds of our children with admirable constancy. At the same time, the triumphal expansion of the number of schools in the increasingly centralized control of national education has spread the democratization of ineptitude to the farthest corners and the poorest people of the country. And why do these things happen? They happen because Brazil's uneducated elite goes along with the media and the volatile prestige of the cultural celebrities of the day instead of examining and testing their ideas. And by doing so, our elite only heaps up errors and disasters with an obscene persistence. Whoever noticed this phenomenon cannot but conclude that Brazil's chief educational problem is precisely the opposite of what people usually say it is. That is to say, our problem is not that we have educated the elite and left the people behind, but rather that we have tried to provide education to all the people before we had a qualified elite to educate them. 
or even to seriously examine the problem of popular education. Anyone, anyone who has been a teacher, at least for a day, immediately realizes the education process has a radiation, radiating structure. First, we educate 10 people, who in turn will go on and educate 100 people, who in turn will educate 1,000 people, who in, will in turn will educate a million, and so on and so forth. To revert this order is like wanting children to generate their parents. The rulers of my country have promised education to millions of people before they have been able to gather together, to gather together ten serious educators to discuss how they're going to do this. Why not educate in the first ten first? And to those who may object that this is a right-wing editive, I recommend they read Lenin and ask themselves why he organized the Communist Party's elite first and then the mass. Lenin knew that the tail does not wag the dog. How to break the vicious circle of an educated elite guarded by amateurs as inept as itself? In my view, there is only one way. We have to raise, outside the official educational system, far from the mainstream media, far from long-established prestige, a new, sincere, and well-prepared class of intellectuals who, moreover, must be aggressive enough to, in due course, be bad airheads, expel sacred coasts, and start dealing with problems in a serious manner. A second conclusion is that the government can only define programs, methods, budgets, that is the more external and insubstantial aspect of education. <coughs> None of these abstract universals has the ability to go into the classroom and guide the souls and minds of students toward a better development. The teacher's personality is all. You can ask any student of any grade about it. Some te teachers make deep impressions on the student and have an almost hormonal influence on their intellectual and human, human growth. Others are just forgotten after a few years, and still others become traumatic obstacles to any conceivable progress. The problem here is somewhat the same as everywhere else, the problem of human quality. Governments are so helpless about it that sometimes the worst regimes in the world raised by the power of suffering the best personalities. And as soon as conditions improve, the souls settle down and deteriorate. The raising of better individuals can only come from society itself, from spontaneous cultural initiatives. Religious organizations, neighborhood associations and clubs, labor unions, community centers can do a lot about it, provided that they are not committed to any political agenda aimed at standardizing minds to use them as pawns. In Brazil, to find a civic association, association which is free of this commitment has become increasingly difficult. Finally, there remains the problem of home education. In Brazil, the permanent state of social and economic insecurity leads parents in their desire to seek an immediate guarantee of livelihood to their children, for their children, to deliberately turn their kids into mediocre human beings inducing them to get an education only to be able to pass civil service, service exams instead of promoting the development of their intelligence to reach more ambitious goals in the long term. A good intention deformed by fear is no longer a good intention. It becomes a deforming process. I have observed this phenomenon in virtually all Brazilian families I have met. A little bit of educational experience shows that the desire for premature social adaptation can cripple a mind and severely limit the very prospects for social ascension. People do not come with their vocations stamped on their foreheads, nor with a manual where they can find out in advance their most promising talents. But what is absolutely certain is that one can only be successful in those things which reflects one's deepest in innate talents. A teenager who deems of trying his standard sports, fine arts, or any profession which seems exotic 
with his family, like a career in immersion, marine, in polar expedition, or animal caretaking, can easily be induced to favor if his parents impose upon him choices which seem, which seem more realistic in a limit, limited and mediocre mental atmosphere. I dare say that this is one of the most wide, widespread causes of human failure in Brazil. If you think your child is a moron who cannot survive in a field of free choice and with all the crutches of a depressing government job, it would have been better if you had not generated or if you had given him to be raised by a more optimistic family. Besides, what help can the Brazilian government offer in such matters if it is itself predominantly staffed with enough people for whom the people mediocre would even be a compliment? To the present Brazilian government, as to most of its Latin American counterparts, the new generations are both instruments for the implementation of nominally saving policies, which despise, despise the present generation in the name of an elusive and unattainable future. I say unattainable not only because they are unrealizable in practice, but because their conception is already infected with the promise of endless deferral. Every revolutionary politics which aims to reshape the world in its image and likeness begins by denying all higher values in order to be able to establish its own values, which implies that the revolutionary politics cannot accept any judge superior to itself. This is why only the permanent revolution exists, that is, the pursuit of goals which have neither a definition nor a deadline to be achieved, so that the revolutionary work might never be judged, but might always keep pushing itself further into the future so that it might perpetuate its condition of sole judge of all things. The third and final conclusion relates to the difference between education and instruction. To instruct a student is simply to pass on to him a set of procedures, habits, techniques, and even mental tics that the teacher has received ready, ready made. The Department of Education should be called the Department of Instruction because every educational activity whose model comes from above and is uniformly imposed to an entire population is on instruction. Education, as the etymology of the word implies, has something to do with opening the eyes of the student so that he might see the larger world around him and he might, he might see it with his own individual and intransferable eyes without anybody imprisoning him in a pre-existing framework. Clearly, if instruction can be a social activity performed by a collective collectivity of technicians, education, in the sense that I understand it, must be a deep connection between the soul of the teacher and the soul of the student, a relationship that imitates, on a smaller and limited scale, the relation between father and son. Thus, it is clear that the teacher has to convey to the student, rather than this or that, particular piece of knowledge, a certain inspiration, a power, an enthusiasm, and a love for the search for the truth. And it is also clear that no one can give what he himself does not have. True education is a laborious and late result of the form of self-education, which they explain in the soul of the education, educator and precedes education. These considerations, however, are so far above the current state of affairs in Brazilian education that I do not see any way to put them into action except in small groups without any illusion of interfering in the present state of things but preparing perhaps a better future. Thank you so much. For discussion and debate, if you want to take some questions, right? If anyone has some questions, please put the mic here. There's somebody over here. No. Oh, yeah. There's.
Thank you, Professor. It's just amazing the words you use. And it's so precise. What, um, in your observation, and things, what steps can be taken in your country to reverse the challenge you have before you? I'm not sure I understood your, your question. If, uh, can, can you repeat the question? I was yes, I, my question is this. In your analysis, you're saying that you're, you're going in a spiral downhill. Yeah. And you are making your, your students aware because you are at a university level, correct? What steps can be taken within the educational system that you are trying to implement? I believe uh, we have to start with small, small groups, small and independent groups. And were you able to hear when um, Dr. Judith Resman spoke about uh, the Kinsey report? No, I just arrived. <laughs> oh, okay. Because right there would be a beautiful place to start. Um, but I, I'm sure she'll tell you more about it because it's pretty heavy. Thank you. My name is Mike Donnelly. I am uh, the Director for International Affairs at the Home School Legal Defense Association. We are advocates for home education. I gave a presentation earlier today that you did not, uh, did not have the benefit of hearing. Um, an excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your, for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very, very interesting and insightful. Uh, and I'm, I'm impressed with the common challenges that you articulate, that you're explaining are happening in Brazil that we see here in America as far as the problems with education. I was very critical of John Dewey myself earlier today, the destroyer of American education. I, I think it's very well put. However, you made a comment about home education, and I wasn't quite sure what you meant, um, but I would say that in America, here in the United States, home education is producing civic leaders, not civic followers. Yeah, but home education is one thing, and so homeschooling is another. Are they different? Yeah, I, I use the term not with the intent to, to, uh, to mean homeschooling. Of course, homeschooling is completely different. Eh? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know, is it? How is it different? Uh, I, with home education, I mean the, uh, only the, the practice of everyday interchange between Parents and children. Ah, okay. It's so not, not like inform completely informal, huh? I understand. So you, when you said home education, you meant simply parents talking with their children. That's home, it. That's it. Yeah. Not parents taking on the entire education. No, 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 no. Okay. If they they did homeschooling, probably I will not need to be here today. <laughs> well, maybe, but uh, I'm I, the the homeschool movement in Brazil is very small. It's very, very small. Very, very small, very, very but small. it is active. I know. And it is growing. I know. And, uh, it's, uh, so. You know, there are uh, many legal problems. The, the government oppresses them and persecutes them. I have myself been writing several articles to defend these people because they are the, be the best educators in Brazil. Very good. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. I, um, I would also like to congratulate you. It was um, a very insightful um, speech. Um, I hear the word fear a lot in um, what you're saying with the current situation. And um, the fear of educating from parents also. Um, it, 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 it's understandable. And um, you talked about the teacher and the teacher having uh, a connection, um, a direct connection to the student that you have to connect. It's a connection of the soul, you said. Then the teacher has to convey a certain inspiration, knowledge, and search for the truth. But you also said that no one can have what, no one can give what he or she does not have. Now, what my question is, 
um, then that, that comes to me in my, my mind, things about teacher training and, teach, and studying teach, um, teacher programs you know, so that you can have that and you can um, teach that connection. And is that something that you are seeking? Of course, the, the teacher training can be better or worse. But the, uh, this is not the, the, the main point of the problem. The main point is self-education. In order to become an educator, you don't have just to receive education, you have to educate yourself. Uh, when I was a child, I had a brutal complex of inferiority because I thought everybody was understanding everything and I was the only moron on the face of earth. <laughs> and this made me an educator because I have to, to find, again, my own complex, my own stupidity, and so on. And so for me, it's, uh, it's not very difficult to understand, to grasp the difficulties in the mind of the student, because I had the same difficulties uh, half a century ago. So uh, you have to go from self-education to education. Yeah? So education is not just something you, you can uh, uh, acquire by technical teaching. Uh, you can, uh, you should not only receive education, but give yourself an education. What, what do you think about all this movement, the social movements in, in America right now, that they are um, um, imposing, uh, you know, their educational system? They are telling you what to, what you should be learning. This is, this is a complete disaster, because this is a, an attempt to, to make all minds uniform. Everybody thinks the, the, the same thing. You see, there was a, a, a commission in the Brazilian House of Representatives that was discussing this problem of gay, gay marriage. And everybody was favorable to gay marriage. Everybody, almost everybody. Then came one guy who was against gay marriage. And everybody protested. You are obstructing the debate. <laughs> <laughs> so for them, the normal thing is everybody to think the same, the same way in the same things. This is the reason I put the title of my book, The Collective Imbecile. Because you know, the uh, Italian ideologue, Antonio Gramsci, was the founder of the Italian Communist Party. He had the idea, he called it the collective intellectual. Mm -hmm. This is the party, the Communist Party, who thinks collectively. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, wow, well, this is not the collective intellect, this is collective imbecile. <laughs> and so the, the, my book was a parody of, of Antonio Grant's concept. Thank you. Thank you.